So, thank you very much for um, inviting us to speak here. And uh, I am very grateful for that. And I'm happy to see so many young people, though my talk is prepared for uh, experts. I thought that some experts from mathematics, physics, and so on would come. But they have apparently, they are too frightened to come and face this issue because I said that whatever mathematics that you teach, you need to justify it publicly and not merely teach to your students uh, <coughs> who cannot protest what is going on. Right? So let me start on a little personal note. So I started off with physics and uh, I switched to math for MSc because I thought that uh, it is necessary to know mathematics in order to do physics. And then I became a UGC GIF and went to GIF. I was banished to GIF because my head of the department said I didn't want to see your face. I was doing courses there. said I don't want to see your face in the university. Because I never used to attend classes and so on. So, and this was a very odd thing because my wife was doing a PhD in the university and TIF is uh, some 15, 20 kilometers again. So he meant it literally and I bumped into him. He said that, uh, why are you here? I told you not to show your face. So he meant he is a very good, he is a gentleman. And he thought it was uh, best for me. Uh, very nice person, but uh, this was something which was a very strange situation. So the point is I wanted to do mathematics or physics and I hated what coursework they gave in the airport because it had nothing whatsoever to do with physics, algebraic, topology, all sorts of stuff, absolutely useless. <coughs> so I ran away from there, I ran away from there and uh, the first lesson I learned was that most of formal math is useless. It is useless. That's what I am going to say. And uh, also that people say it is beautiful aesthetic. I said it is ugly and repulsive and most children, they run away. <laughs> See, Plato said both mathematics and music should be taught. And uh, you don't have to be taught to like music. You like it. I'm sure all of you like music. And you don't like math, most of you. <laughs> Am I right? Yes. So why this distinction? Because math has been made horrible. It has been made horrible. And uh, that is what we are trying to correct. It has been made horrible over the years. So I left Mumbai. I joined IIT Delhi. So it was from the flying pan into the fire. So I joined IIT Delhi for PhD in math. I attended one class. I asked one question and the teacher could not answer. And he said, so what, you know mathematics, I don't, so what, don't I have a right to earn a living? So I left IIT Delhi and then I joined ISI, which was next door. So I have a blog on it, if you see, idiots and IIT. Nothing like it. <laughs> nothing like the three idiots. Okay, just the opposite. So that is what I learned that most mathematicians in this country, common mathematicians, are incompetent. <coughs> Very sad state of affairs, but that is how it is. And uh, then I did my PhD from ISI and I made a strange uh, career choice. Nobody from ISI goes to a state level university, which I did. I went to Pune University, not even a central university. They all go abroad, all they stay in Delhi, which means well funded institute. But I did that. And I, I won't go into the reason, but I taught to process functional analysis and real analysis. Now the point is that in real analysis, I don't know if any of you have learned it. Have you? Some of you? So my talk was prepared for a more expert audience. So I used to teach that a differentiable function must be continuous. And therefore a discontinuous function cannot be differentiable. But in the functional analysis class, I used to teach the exact opposite that a discontinuous function can be differentiated infinitely many times. The Heaviside theta function can be differentiated and its derivative with the Dirac delta and so on. And I remember once I gave a talk in IIT BHU, another incompetent mathematician there was a professor, or assistant professor, or associate professor, or whatever, he walked out. You are saying a function, discontinuous function can be differentiated as it is. I have been doing it from my childhood. He didn't like it. 
because he teaches something and he thought that mathematics is true. It is not. So the point is that mathematics has nothing to do with truth. Mathematical theorems are not connected with truth and it is, uh, it is uh, nothing to do with reality. Formal mathematical theorems. Okay? It is metaphysics, it is completely subjective, you can twist it as you like, it all depends upon your popularity and so on. And the public opinion. Okay, community opinion. Community opinion means like this. So, many of our uh, incompetent mathematicians don't know about these multiple definitions and they don't know uh, which definition of the derivative I wanted to do with it because it's done with differential equations. So, which definition of the derivative applies to the equations of physics, they don't know. Naturally, they don't know in Delhi University, neither in the math department nor in the physics department. The different definitions of the derivative, which one applies? They are not equivalent. And this leads to very hard problems of physics which I was working with. Shock waves, the renormalization problem of quantum field theory and so on. So I won't uh, bore you with the details but the point is that uh, because nobody understands. What's the point? I'm talking to a wall. There are five people in the world who understand. So I left that. The point is that most people don't know what they are doing. When they are talking about physics, they don't know how to do it and there is a problem. So it seems like I was head of the application development sector and uh, we had a lot of money. Mathematics is a very covetous. We had a million dollars a month. A very small group of people and we could spend it as we like. So, uh, but they were not able to provide a solution because they had problems. They had problems related to space, related to oil and so on. They were not able to provide a solution. They said we have proved this theorem now you go and see if you can apply. It's not my job to see if I can apply it. I have a problem, you give me a solution. Which is a smart thing in academics is to give a solution and tell people to find a problem to which it applies. But the real life situation is that you have a problem and you want a solution. You're extracting oil, you want a solution. You're sending a rocket somewhere, you want a solution. And they could not do that. And they were unable to contribute a solution. So the sixth lesson that I learned was that real life problems are very simple for mathematics which uh, these people give. And I'm talking about stochastic differential equations. I don't know how many people here may have my point. I don't know if anybody here understands stochastic differential equations. They are complex kinds of differential equations. Not your plain ordinary differential equations. I won't go into that. Driven by levy motion. They are used in finance. Stock markets are driven. They are levy distribution. <coughs> and you are used there, but you can't solve them in formal mathematics. You can solve them in a simple way. I have a software which does that. You want to see it sometime, I'll show you. Then I shifted to this project of history of Indian science, philosophy, culture, where the idea was there were the leading intellectuals of the country. They said that we should tell our own stories. Foreigners have been telling our stories for us. Why should we be the subject of their story? We should create our own stories. So I did that. And then I discovered that most of the current history of math is false. Completely false. And then I produced a big book, 500 page book, I have brought it is left in the car, which uh, shows that calculus was invented in India, taken to Europe, and people are not willing to admit it. It was taken to Europe where it was not properly understood. And because it was not understood, it becomes difficult. I'll try to explain that. So there are lies not just about history, but also about philosophy. You see, the school text, all of you must have studied class 9 school text, which has a story, chapter on Euclid. It says that Euclid discovered axiomatic math. Completely false. It's a book. Book is there in front of you. There are no axiomatic proofs in it. And NCRT lies, and they will not change. So you have to understand that through math you are being fooled. Because you don't understand math. They made math difficult, you are afraid of it, you listen to whatever is told and therefore they take the opportunity to fool you. And somebody controls mathematical knowledge and through that they control science, claims of science and so on. There is a lot of advantage to that. And this axiomatic proof was part of the church theology. It was not part of Euclid. So I have an article on that for common persons. The Church Origin of Axiomatic Math, it is in Medium, you can check it, it is for ordinary people. The complete lie that it started with Greeks. 
There is not a single axiomatic proof in any Greek text on geometry. There is a proof in Aquinas, Summa Theologica, Aquinas and the schoolmen who worked during the Crusades. So the point, point is, this kind of mathematics, formal mathematics, it prohibits facts. Why do you do mathematics? You do it for science. Science is based on facts, based on experiments, based on the empirical. So why should you prohibit facts? Why should you do that kind of mathematics? That is the critical issue. Ganit accepts empirical proof, formal mathematics prohibits it. That's the central difference that we have got. And because, you see, all dogmas are contrary to fact. So church did not want facts. So the facts, bekar, use this. So that's the problem we have, and that crept, crept into mathematics at a later stage. So uh, the point is that if somebody thinks that I, what I'm saying is wrong, please produce an axiomatic proof in the Euclid book. What is an axiomatic proof? You need to understand and produce it. Please ask anybody you know, anybody in the math department is an open challenge. It's an open challenge. In this math department, anywhere, go to IIT, go to JNU, go where you want. None of them will be able to do this. I have invited them, they are not coming. I invited each person in the mathematics department here. All right. So the point is that first axiomatic proof was given by Hilbert in 1899, and Church used axiomatic proofs in the theology of reason. They are not found in geometry before 1899. All right. So that's the central question that we have. Why should we teach this formal math, which the colonizer brought, which is Western math, which is Western ethno-mathematics? Why is this not off? So that's the central question. What should we teach? Whether we should teach uh, Ganit, because most of you think that Ganit is just a Hindi translation of mathematics. It is not. That is how NCRT tells you. It labels the textbooks as textbooks on mathematics. All right? So Ganit is not equal to math. They are two completely different things. Because Ganit accepts Pratyaks Pranam, Praman, and mathematics rejects it. That's the difference. Empirical proof. I used to say empirical proof. I thought everybody understands. Empirical is Pratyaks, what is in front of you. So you are in front of me, I am in front of you, that is pratyaksha. What you can see, what you can touch, what you can feel, what you can hear, and so on, that is pratyaksha. So, Ganit accepts that, mathematics prohibits it, axiomatic mathematics, formal mathematics, western ethnomathematics, which the colonizer brought and which you are taught. Okay. So, how do we know? I am saying this, how do you know? So, first thing I can say is that if you want the textual proof, then you can go to the Nyaya Sutra 2, and this gives the means of proof used in Indian philosophy. Every system of Indian philosophy accepts Pratyaksha. These are four means of proof. Pratyaksha, Anuman, Upman, Shabd. Pratyaksha, what is in front of you, Anuman, what you reason, Upman by analogy, Shabd by authority. And this is elaborated here. So Pratyaksha is this. For example, uh, if you have a plumb line, you have seen a mystery doing things. If you want to determine verticality, he takes a plumb line, says that is the vertical. If you want to de determine horizontally, he takes water, surface of the water is level. That is Pratyaksha. But West says, oh, that is uh, nonsense. That's not mathematics. We do something very superior. So that's the point that has to be contested. There is the Indian proof of the Pythagorean theorem in the Yukti Bhasha. I won't go into that. Anuman, the reasoning, how did we deduce that the earth is round? A very simple way of deducing. You cannot see far off trees. If you have a ship going, it disappears over the horizon. The distance at which it disappears allows you to calculate the radius of the earth. All right. So, Pratyaksha is accepted in Ganit. Anuman is also accepted. The fact that you accept Pratyaksh does not mean that you reject reasoning. As in science, you accept empirical proof, experimental proof, but you also accept reasoning. But mathematics prohibits it. How do we know that it prohibits it? You can see uh, 
a text on mathematical logic. Now, I don't know whether you'll understand this, because this is what it says. <laughs> what it says is that any a proof in mathematics is a sequence of statements in which each statement is either an axiom or is derived from preceding statements by means of some rule of reasoning. Let me explain it to you in terms of what your class 9 text states. Beware of what you see. Beware of being deceived by what you see. Don't be beware of being deceived by stories, by this, that, all sorts of things. Beware of what you see. What is the most reliable thing you beware of? This is the trick that is played to you in this in class 9 text, which everybody has read, but nobody must have read this because it's in the appendix. It is not asked in exam, so you don't read it. Am I right? But it is there in your class 9 NCRT text for so many years. It is available online. Please download it. It is there in the appendix. Beware of what you see. You must only work on anuman, on reasoning, but not on what you see. What you see is unreliable. Actually, reasoning is very unreliable. Have you played, do you play chess? Can you win against a um, uh, computer? Yeah? So the point is the world champion loses to a computer. Why? Because chess is a game of pure reasoning. But every human being makes a mistake in a complex task of reasoning. That is not the case with sight. You may occasionally make a mistake. You may mistake a rope for a snake, dim light or snake for a rope. Doesn't happen every time. So, Anuman deduction is more fallible. They don't tell you that. Both are fallible, but this is more fallible. And this, I mean, you can try, you take a look. I have got some nice chess programs. If you think you can win, nobody can win. The world champion also loses. All right. Then it says that there is something wrong. It says that uh, Greeks alone reuse reason. Class 9 text says that. And this was superior. Therefore, the West is superior, therefore you must imitate it, you must ape it. But that's not true, we just saw the Nyaya Sutra 2, Anuman uses reason. Sir, the latest edition of NCERT says Latest edition, 9th standard, please take a look. Okay. All right? It does not matter which edition we are talking about, this is very stark mathematical theory, they cannot change it. All right, All right. this has been there, for, they have been saying this for so many centuries. It is part of the church theology. And it's all false. No, I was just no, it is there in the latest edition or in any edition. It is there in all math texts. That is why I gave you that Mendelssohn thing. It is, no, don't think that it is something unique to NCRT. That is why I first gave you Mendelssohn. Introduction to Mathematical Logic. That's a text from 1963. Undergraduate text. It's used throughout the world. So, this is the falsehood that is drilled into you, the falsehood that is indoctrinated, that you are indoctrinated into, which the mathematics, mathematicians in the math department will not face. They cannot publicly confront it. Uh, you are Duta president, <laughs> ex Duta president. So many times I invited her, now she's run away, she's retired. <laughs> All right. Nandita Narayan, let me take her name. She is to teach real analysis. Last two, three years I have been calling her. Please come, come for a discussion, come for a public discussion. You are teaching children and they learn something and they can't protest. Come and defend it publicly, won't do it, it's unethical. So Aryabhat inferred and so on and the uh, point is the inference is from facts, from observations. In mathematics, formal mathematics, the inference is from axioms, from assumptions, from postulates which can go wrong. The very classic example in Indian tradition of Lokayat. A person makes artificial footprints of a wolf. He wants to persuade his wife and he goes to a village and makes footprints of a wolf and then people come and say, oh, there was a wolf around and he says, look at these fools, they are inferring, I made the footprints, but they assume that the footprints are made by a wolf. So if your assumption, the assumption is right because you don't even know what the assumption is most of the time. All right. So reason was used and uh, reason starts from empirical as in science. So that's the point, Ganit uses both empirical and reasoning like science. So, class 9 text deliberately fools you by using one term reason for two different notions. This was the church propaganda, theology of reason. Be reasonable. Right? So, the point is there are two types of reason. Scientific reason, which is reason plus empirical facts. And religious reason, which is reason minus facts. 
So mathematics uses religious reason, and you use one word reason for both of them, you get confused. All right? And deliberately, this is a deliberate act to try and confuse you. And nobody is willing to change. Well, it's up to you to fight. My life is almost over. It is you and your children who will have a problem. So it's up to you to fight. And if you can't fight, you can be slaves all your life. The choice is yours. So religious reason and scientific reason. Religious reason is what is used in mathematics. Scientific reason is what is used in science and in Ganit. Reason plus empirical, reason minus empirical is reason. Okay. So let's get back to the central question now. What should we teach? And mind you, I am very clear. I am not saying we should teach Ganit because it is our tradition. I have never said it. I am saying we should teach Ganit because it is better. Do what is better. And I am saying Ganit is better, mathematics is worse. If it's our tradition, it will remain confined to the national boundaries. I'm not saying that. I'm talking to the whole world. I've done this in three countries, South Africa especially. What happened to the gentleman who was to come? Chakrasar. His flight didn't reach. He said he was coming here by two. Two. Well, so he, he is working in Africa with African children. So that's why I remembered suddenly he was supposed to come. He is coming from Mumbai just for this talk. And he missed it. Okay. So uh, we teach math for what purpose? For science. All right. So I am saying teach Ganit because Ganit is better. Mathematics is inferior. Contrary to what your school text has taught you that it is superior. All right. So we teach math for science. And the question is... Why is reasoning minus facts good for science? Can somebody explain? Why should you prohibit facts if you want to use something for science? And the reason is, it's a political reason that by prohibiting facts, by relying on assumptions, the West controls mathematical knowledge and through it, it controls certain aspects of science like you think Stephen Hawking is a great guy. Do you know what he did? You all think, you believe, you, you have told the story, you accept it, but you don't know what he did. He did creationism for the church. That is why he is so much so famous, and that's why, but you can't understand it. That's the problem. You control mathematical knowledge, and you fool people, and you do propaganda. The Nobel Prize was given for that, to Pen, Penrose. So this claim of Western superiority is that you must ape the West, which you do all the time. That's the central teaching of colonial education because they wanted to make you submissive. The whole purpose of colonial education was not to give you gyan. You mistakenly think that the purpose of education is to give you gyan. It is to make you submissive, to prevent revolts of the kind that took place in 1857. And Macaulay said that very clearly in a speech in British Parliament in 1847. He was not talking about Indians, he was talking about British. He was afraid there would be revolts in Britain. And he said, educate the poor people so that they don't revolt. Speech is there. I can give you the reference if anybody is interested. Speeches of my colleague. Available on that. So the point is this claim of Western superiority is a very evil, vicious claim. It comes from an earlier claim of Christian supremacy, which was used to support genocide. You know, there is no Native Americans left in Americas. They are all killed. How were they killed? It was morally justified by saying they are non-Christian, so it is good to kill them. There were so many slaves, black slaves. What was the justification? They're non-Christian, therefore enslaved them. That is Bull Romanus Pontifex. So this article of mine will give you the details if you want. So I'm saying that uh, there is a, uh, 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 there was a mutation of a doctrine of Christian supremacy to the doctrine of white supremacy. And the conference going on on religious origins. And from white supremacy, it mutated to Western supremacy. Because in India, they came and said that Aryans conquered you. They are whites. They populated everything. And therefore, they could not say white supremacy. And they could not say Christian supremacy after some time because blacks converted to Christianity. So they could not use it to keep them slaves. And slavery was very profitable, like colonialism. So that's the point. They are connected. Now let me start explaining why the West is backward, why it is inferior in mathematics has always been. 
See the very names of numbers, Greek, small numbers. They are derived from Sanskrit names. Can you read it? Yes or no? How is that? That is too big. Yeah, so you have Chatur and you have Panch, which is from March, Chat, and so on. Seven, Hapta, you say Hapta, seven, right? And uh, these are in uh, Persian. The, uh, let me reduce it a bit, it's too big. Uh. I also have a vision problem. All right. So, for example, November is from now is nine. December, thus you have, and so on. So, uh, these names are derived from Sanskrit names. And the point is that they are derived, I say, this way because for large numbers, uh, they didn't have names. The Greek and Roman names stopped at myriad. How much is the myriad? 10,000. And this is the Oxford English Dictionary for you, if you don't believe me. Myriad is 10,000 as a number. All right, 10,000. But myriad means infinity. That's the connotation. Myriad stars. So 10,000 was infinity. Because they couldn't count more than that. And if you actually start counting, it's a lot to count. But Indians had huge large numbers. Okay, you find large numbers in the Jesuit way. So you, I'm giving you a simple version. It's not uh, Vedic Sanskrit. So ek, das, shata, sahasra, and so on. And everything increases by 10. You go up to Parad, which is a trillion, 10 to the power 12. This is there in the Jesuit way, 17.2. All right. <coughs> then if you see the Lalit Pistar Sutta, which is the life of the Buddha, you'll find huge numbers there. 10 to the power 53 is Talakshan, and it goes on. It goes to 10 to the power 80. Now, how do you write 10 to the power 80 in your Roman numerals, or Greek Roman numerals? You can't do it. <laughs> It'll take a lifetime. <laughs> All right. So, this is why names are the same, and it went from here because we had much better arithmetic. We are talking only of arithmetic. We're coming to other things. So it took a few thousand years for the West to wake up and realize that it is inferior in mathematics. In arithmetic, elementary arithmetic, names are numbers. So they gave up their primitive system of Roman numerals. All right? So my point is not just that they learned from us. I am not talking about garb se kaho. I am saying they did not understand because we are talking about math teaching. And I am saying they did not understand and therefore they made math difficult and they imposed it on us during colonialism. So they learnt, but they like, how, why did they not understand? Because they learnt second hand. If you, somebody copies from you in an exam, what will happen? He will not do as well as you do. He'll copy less. He'll understand less. So that is what happened. So they had immense difficulties in understanding what they learnt from us. Okay. Uh, so Gerbert, ah, I forgot to give the forgot to give the picture. So Gerbert constructed an abacus, which is the first Arabic numerals when they came to uh, Europe from Cordoba. But it is foolish because algorithms algorithms are called after Al Khwarizmi, who wrote Hisab al Hind, which is how they were known in Europe. So algorithms are very efficient. They are an efficient way of doing arithmetic. Algorith Al Abacus is a very inferior way of doing arithmetic. I'm sorry I didn't put in all the pictures <coughs> because I thought I would be speaking to experts here. So the point I'm making is Gerbert, who was Pope Sylvester, who was considered a very learned man, so learned that he's accused of black magic. Learned people are always accused. They are regarded with great suspicion. So he was accused of black magic and he failed to understand that algorithms make arithmetic efficient. He thought it's all the same. He wrote a book on Abacus. So then Fibonacci, 13th century, he was a Florentine merchant. He was trading in Africa. And in Africa, he got this Hisab al-Hind. And so he learned. And he realized that it is efficient. 
and therefore it gives you a comparative advantage in commerce. All right? So Florentines accepted it. But they failed to understand. What did they fail to understand? They failed to understand zero. Why did they fail to understand zero? The very word zero comes from Zephyr, from Sifra. Sifra means cipher. Cipher means a mysterious code. It is from cipher. It's a mysterious code. So what was mysterious about zero? They failed to understand. They banned it. Well, they did not ban it. They passed a law against it. And the law says that if you write anything in uh, Arabic numerals, you must also write it in words. <coughs> and you still follow that when you write checks. So point is, they failed to understand zero. They took it. And again, why was it mysterious? Because Roman numerals are additive. X plus X plus I is 10 plus 10 and so on. But uh, if I take uh, something like uh, uh, 10, 10 is not 1 plus 0, which is 1. All right? So they did not understand. Then they failed to understand fractions, very elementary stuff. They failed to understand. And we are talking about their top people. Failed to understand it in the 16th century, end of the 16th century. How do we know that? The calendar was primitive. So the earlier Julian calendar used leap years. It did not say the year is 365 and one fourth day. It said every fourth year is a leap year. And now when they corrected it in the 16th century, 1582, they still kept a system of leap years because they had fractions, but they were not commonly known. So, uh, well, Gregorian reform used input from India. <coughs> I have this uh, handwritten letter from Matteo Ricci. What this handwritten letter says is that he is looking for an honorable Muiro Honorado, an honorable Moor or Brahmane intelligence, or an intelligent Brahmin to tell him the methods of Indian timekeeping. And Matteo Ricci was a student of Christoph Clavius, who was the head of the Calendar Reform Committee. So uh, that is what we have. So in 1582, they did not know how to do fractions. So Gregorian calendar said, Every fourth year is a leap year, but every hundredth year is not a leap year, except every hundredth year is not a leap year, except every thousandth year is a leap year. They wanted to say 365.241. What a complicated way of saying it. So they did it in a complicated way, and people did not understand. People got confused. Year 2000, is it a leap year or not? So many people got confused. So they did not understand fractions. All right, so bad math led to bad science. Because your calendar is defective, it is inferior. Equinox does not come on the same day each year because it's an average over a thousand years. It's not a correct figure. Correct figure should be 0 0.241. 364.241. But that's not given. And because it's a wrong figure, you are using uh, averages every fourth year, every hundredth year, every thousandth year. You don't get it right every year. So equinox, does it come on the same day? Equinox does not come because the calendar is defective, so it's bad science. Because of bad mathematics, because they did not know fractions. But of course, our uh, Meghnath Saha, who was a calendar reform committee, he was convinced that uh, West is superior and must be imitated, and so he said we must have. And our national calendar, is the Gregorian calendar, <laughs> all right? And it's the, we don't even recognize that it is a religious calendar. It was adopted by the first Nicene Council as the Christian calendar, official Christian calendar to determine the date of Easter. And our secular festivals, two secular festivals we have, Independence Day and Republic Day, they are determined only on the Christian calendar. What a shame. <laughs> all right. So we, point is, they did not understand fractions, they did not understand zero, they did not understand negative numbers. They did not understand negative numbers. Oh, -ho. why didn't I switch it off? <clears throat> so, De Morgan was a very influential professor of the University College London, Augustus De Morgan. All right? And he said negative numbers are impossible. You think negative numbers are impossible? 
See, he said it. He wrote a book. So he says, 10 minus 20 plus 50 is impossible. 10 minus 20 plus 50 is impossible. All right. You think it is impossible. He says, but you see, 10 plus 50 minus 20, no problem. <laughs> Look at this idiot. He is the chap who <laughs> is that. This is 19th century, late 19th century in University College London. He is a professor of mathematics, a very famous professor of mathematics saying this nonsense. Because they did pebble arithmetic. Worse, hold on, that's not the end of the story. You think that's the end of the story? <laughs> there is worse, worse to come. See, he said, what do you say about minus 9? Do you think it is less than 0 or greater than 0? Less than 0. So he says, my God, don't believe it. What you are saying is wrong, that belief in witches is 10,000 times more possible. How do you say quantity A is uh, minus A is less than 0? It is nothing. He goes by pebble arithmetic. 0 means he thinks it is pebble arithmetic, no 0. And so it is less than nothing. It is astonishing. And you should believe in witches. You should believe in judicial astrology. Those are much, much more than believing that minus 9 is less than 0. That's what De Morgan said, professor, star professor of University College London, who wrote so many books, who was so influential. And they say they are superior. And we should imitate them. Right? So this is what has happened. That they took from us, but they did not understand. And they did not. It started where Gerbert started in the 10th century, 976. And De Morgan is 1899. So, thousand years, they were struggling and not understanding simple things of arithmetic, fractions, negative numbers and so on. All right, do I make myself clear? They are inferior. In mathematics, any claim they make of superiority is rubbish history. All right. Okay. So, West imported arithmetic, had great difficulties and took long time to understand. So, they had difficulties with large numbers. They did not have words beyond myriad. They had difficulty with understanding the efficiency. They had difficulty with understanding the place value system. They had difficulty with understanding general fractions. They had difficulty with understanding negative numbers. All right. What is the relevance to math education? You see, there is a principle called phylogeny is ontogeny. As a child grows, it repeats its entire history of the species. See, first it is in water in the womb. Then it comes out. Then it crawls on all fours. Then it stands up. Right? And so you repeat the entire history. And the same thing happens in the mathematics classroom. The entire history is repeated in fast forward mode. So since you learn Western ethno-mathematics, since you learn colonial, if you have colonially educated, you learn it the Western way, you repeat the Western history of the subject. So you go through all those difficulties that the Europe had for thousand years. Had difficulties with negative numbers, have difficulties with fractions, have difficulties with math is stuff. Math is tough, but why are you following them? Why are you not standing up and revolting? You have to revolt, otherwise they will not let go. They are holding on to you. They are suppressing you. <coughs> Please understand that. All right. So this is the relevance that you, those historical difficulties that Europe had are replayed in the math classroom. And that is what makes math so very difficult today. And they are not present in Indian Ganit texts. Ganit texts will start with place value. So they go up to large numbers straight away, at least 10 to the power 18, or 10 to the power 24, or whatever that you need. All right? They have problem, no problems with negative numbers. I think if you want to teach mathematics to farmers especially, they get into debt so fast. That is RIN. And they die. So you have to teach them about RIN, not say that it is impossible. It doesn't exist. So a new curriculum has been made for primary schools. It has not yet been tried out. It is being made with the schools in Kolkata and Bangalore. And we hope to try it out. Geometry. Let me go over it quickly. <coughs> Europeans did not take geometry from India. They took it from Egypt. And they took religious geometry from Egypt. Egypt had different types of geometry. It had practical geometry and it had religious geometry. And therefore, because it's religious geometry, it teaches you mystical stuff. What is the size of a point? What is the size of a point? Simple thing, six standard they teach you. Am I asking you a difficult question? Don't be silent. <laughs> Please tell me quickly. What? Point is dimension. You got into dimension. Another word you are using. So point has no size. 
If it has no size, can you see it? It's invisible. Huh? So that is what is called metaphysics. How will you know? How will the child understand? Point cannot be seen. Line cannot be seen. Plane cannot be seen. Everything cannot be seen. But you have to believe what is written in the text. That is the idea of fooling you. That's where the fooling begins. Right? So, this is, the whole idea is of math that empirical must be prohibited. If you can see it, it is wrong. <laughs> but if I want to make a measurement, I have to see what I'm doing. I can't do it with invisible points. I can't do it with invisible lines. I have to make a measurement. So, they teach you that it is all wrong. Whatever you can see, whatever you can understand is wrong. Naturally, what is left is what you can't understand. <laughs> it becomes difficult. That is the trick. It's a deliberate trick which is played on you and which you don't understand, you don't suspect, and this is a major problem. So that is why you should switch to Ganit. So students are puzzled. I was, I was also puzzled. What is this? Point has no size. I am sharpened my pencil, sharpened my pencil, sharpened it. Point broke. <laughs> so no matter how much you sharpen it, it's not a point. All right. So the problem is that you use compass box. The compass box, you are supposed to make straight lines. Do so you think geometry is about straight lines? It's not. See, that's the major problem. They indoctrinate you. So, therefore, I have this book, Raju Ganit, which is based on a string, which is flexible. So, you can measure curved lines. So, you begin with curved lines. An angle is not true straight lines. It is the length of an arc. It is a chap, not a cone. Cone is a later day word. And so, it's the relative length of a curved arc. They don't teach you. So, you can't measure angles in real life. If I have to teach something like Tithi. So anyway, you have difficulty. Anybody knows what is the radian? You only know to take a protractor, put it there on the piece of paper and measure an angle. Nothing else they taught you. Protractor is ready made. If I ask you how do you make a protractor, you won't know. How do you define a, divide a circle into 180, a semicircle into 180 equal parts, you don't know. So the point is you can't do any real life measurement with your instruments in a compass box. Supposing I have a field which has irregular boundaries. Many agricultural fields have irregular boundaries. How do I have determine its area? How do I determine how much cash to pay for it, tax to pay for it, or how much uh, my output I will get, what is the area, and so on. I can't do it because it's not taught. All right? Now, very important thing is tithi. Tithi is important not just because every event Every event on in India, every holiday is decided by, or not every, almost every holiday is decided by Tithi. And how do I determine Tithi? I have to measure the angle between the sun and the moon. How will you do it? It's not on paper. You can't take a protractor and try. <laughs> so you have to do something little different. And they don't teach it to you. And it is very important because Indian economy depends on agriculture. And agriculture depends on this calendar. The agriculture is, is rainy season. You have so much in songs, Savan Ayore. So, right, you understand it. It's part of the culture. But it is not there. There is no such thing as a rainy season. There are no, I mean, you go to Europe or Britain, it's raining all the time. And rain is not welcome. It is not, it's not rain, rain, go away. Come again, again another day. Right? That's what you learn. So, textbook is ready. Course has been successfully tried out. So, I can just tell you this is the textbook, Raju Ganit. And this is also what was used in Africa, string geometry. So they still use it because it's a practical thing to do. And it is there in the, uh, on the uh, uh, tomb of, uh, uh, I find it difficult to pronounce. Uh, <laughs> it is there in a tomb in uh, Luxor. So you have a, a drawing which uh, shows uh, these rope stretchers, Harpedon Apti. That is what they are called in Britain. And the, this is the course. So it does various things. So it tells you all this. But it ends up by also telling you uh, things like, how do you determine your uh, the size of the earth? Very important problem. How do you determine the size of the earth? I said that Indians did it in Ganit. Every Indian text has it. How do you determine it? They didn't teach you. So why didn't they teach you? Because the aim is to make you ignorant and keep you ignorant. The more ignorant you are, the more submissive you will be. If you don't know, you say, I don't know. I'll ask somebody. Yes, of course. Yes. 
I will come to that just now in a little while. So this has been tried out. It has been tried out in schools. So here's a school in Nasik where we tried out with the children. They loved it. You had a course for one week, but there is a problem because everything that is taught here is contrary to what is done in this school text. So the teachers didn't know how to teach. We did it in Indore. We did it in Gundlupet. So north, south, center. We've done it in various schools. Right? Chamrajnagar. So uh, this has been tried out. It works fine. But the point is state won't allow it. State is determined that you must ape the West. That's the only thing you can learn. We are still a colonial state. You must have colonial education. We have no freedom to change it. 75 years of independence we are celebrating. We can't change our syllabus. We can't discuss what is right, what is wrong. And there's so many differences you, because it becomes a problem. There's no word notion of congruence. There's equality. Congruence is notion introduced by Hilbert. So angle is a curved arc and so on. Pythagorean calculation, there is no theorem. So there is a conflict at every stage. And therefore the teachers found it very difficult. In one class we are teaching that this and next class we teach it's all wrong. How does the teacher teach it? So our uh, tactic now is that uh, we will teach both. We will teach both and we will say that thing is wrong. What is there in your school text and NCRT text is wrong. You make your choice. This is our view. You make your choice. We are teaching you both. One for the exam which is useless. Needed but one for your knowledge. All right, this is our plan in the uh, Kolkata school and Bangalore school. Okay, so this is what we want to change. Now let's look at trigonometry and calculus quickly. So Europeans copied and failed to fully understand, which is also true for trigonometry. So you know the word sign. No, no, teaching two things. two things. Two things and saying that uh, what you are taught in your school text, official school text, which you have to write in the exam is wrong. So it's not so natural when you say what you have to write in the exam is wrong. There is a transition period. Yeah, yeah, we'll discuss it. Yeah. So what is the word sign? You heard the word sign, no? Where does it come from? So let me do it quickly. Sign comes from Jeb. You see, sinus, old. So it comes from Jeb. This Jeb, this is sign. What is sign about it? <laughs> of course, sign about it. <laughs> it is my pocket. So the reason is that uh, the term for sign in Sanskrit was Ja. Ja and Jiva. Ar 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 Aryabhat uses Ardha Ja, which became Jiva. And Jiva was translated into Arabic as Jiba because there is no word sound. And it was written without as just the consonantal skeleton, the way you write uh, your SMS, PLS. So it was written as just J and B. The vowel was omitted. And then the Mozarab translators who were Jews and, uh, well, I'm sorry, who were Jews and Mozarab, they did not know mathematics. So when they translated, they said, what is this J and B? Must be J, the common word. So they <laughs> So this is what happened. And now what do we do? We have to copy. So they made a foolish mistake. We must copy that foolish mistake. You heard the story of the monkey and the cap? Where are we? So it's a very pathetic situation that fourth hand we are copying their foolish mistakes. And this is the term that we have everywhere. All right. So when it, the word, very word shows that trigonometry went from India to Europe. All right. And West did not understand it, but we continue to use it. All right. Now the problem is trigonometry talks about triangles. That's a conceptual error. It's not just about words. It's a conceptual error because it's about a circle. It's not about a triangle. Now I ask students what is sign of 92 degrees. Anybody knows? Sign of 92 degrees. What? <coughs> Minus. <laughs> you give me a number. Give me a number. Point nine six something. But how would you calculate it? Because if I am going to define sine as opposite side upon hypotenuse, there is no triangle which has got 92 degrees. 
no right angle triangle. You are right. No right angle triangle which has got an additional angle of 92 degrees. All right, at least not on the plane. You can have two right angles on a sphere. So, how do you do it? But you know the value, your calculator knows the value, so something wrong. Right? Something very wrong, and they teach you the wrong thing. Why? Because they want to keep you inferior. All right? Now, the other question I ask is about sine of one degree. What is sine of one degree? Oh, this is important. No, how do you calculate it? How do you calculate it? Something small, but how do you calculate it? You need to calculate it because if you want to know the radius of the Earth, you will have to calculate sine of one degree. And if you just say something, something, then the radius of Earth will also be something, something. All right, it will go very wrong, and if you are using it to navigate, you will drown. So just something, something will not do. If you want to know how to calculate it, that's the question. Does anybody know how to calculate sine of one degree? At the back there, madam, you're dozing off or reading a book. I am very interested in the book you're reading. Yes. Do you know how to calculate sine of one degree? Why didn't they teach you? Because you needed to calculate the size of the earth, which you need for navigation, which is what I'm coming to. And it is easily done using trigonometry. How do you do it? You do this simple thing. You measure the height of a hill. How? Using trigonometry. Then you climb the hill and measure the angle of dip, which will be very small, one degree or less. And then from that you reduce the size. But if you don't know sine of one degree accurately, your error estimate will be, I mean, your error, you will get huge error. Supposing you're just a boat. Now that's my conception of a boat. My drawing is bad. And this is a tree. So you're seeing the top of the tree. If you're going in a boat, when your island comes, you just see the top of the tree. So it will be a very small angle. And it becomes important to, this is a formula if you're interested. It's a very simple formula for radius of the earth. It's a very simple formula. All right? I won't go into that. My point is just that you don't know. And why don't you know when it is such a simple thing? Because you have a problem with measuring one degree and finding the sign. And because they did not understand trigonometry, they did not know, the West did not know the radius of the earth. And therefore, they drowned so many of them. Why? See, Columbus, you say, knew it. His estimate was off by 40%. No, when he reached uh, uh, Mexico, he said he is off the coast of Cathay. <laughs> I reached China. He wrote in his diary, They're completely wrong. So this is what Brahmagupta said: ignorance of the Earth radius, Bhu Vyasasya, Bhu Vyas. Earth radius is Bhu Vyas, Bhu Vyasasya Agyanat. If you are ignorant of the Earth radius, Vyartham Deshantaram, it is futile to talk of longitude. If you don't know the earth radius and you don't know sine of one degree, then you don't know earth radius. All right, so they didn't know. They couldn't measure. And so it became a very famous longitude problem of European navigation. From 15th century till 18th century, it was a big thing for which governments offered huge prices. British government, as late as 1702, British Act of Parliament, offering a prize of 20,000 pounds those days. 20,000 pounds was uh, something like uh, uh, 10 years salary or 20 years salary for Newton. 20,000 pounds, I mean, it's like the Viceroy's salary. 20,000 pounds, a huge amount for a method of determining longitude because they did not know the radius of the earth correctly. So on the uh, central principle of teaching, colonial teaching, if the West, you are not taught this because you must repeat their mistakes. You must repeat because you don't have the brains to stand up, you don't have the courage to stand up and fight and say, why are you teaching us this nonsense? They know you are too dabbu. <laughs> right? And that is why they suppress you. That's the whole idea. So this is the first step, calculating sine on one degree, and this is what Aryabhat did. So Aryabhat's sine table, well, it won't make any sense to you. This is what it says, maki, baki, faki, dhaki. <laughs> so it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't, it's not Sanskrit. These, These are, are his uh, it's a numerical notation. It will take a lot of time to explain to you. 
So I won't explain to you. These are the numbers. Final numbers. These are the numbers. He is giving some numbers. There is only one Sanskrit word there, which is Ardhaja. Kala Ardhaja. Two words. Kala, minutes. Ardhaja, half. Uh, half cord. Right? So this is what he is saying. But the point I am making is he is giving sign differences. What is the importance of sign differences? If I want to calculate sign of 1, I need to know sign differences. Even if you know only sign of 30 and sign of 0, you can calculate the difference and you can use the difference by using the elementary rule of 3. What is the rule of 3? It is called, uh, oh, where is it gone? OK. So rule of 3, uh, tri rashik. It's a very simple thing, and you can use it. And you can calculate if sign changes over 30 degrees by so much amount, how much will it change in one degree? And therefore, what is the amount? It's a very simple calculation, which you must have done in school so many times. If 10 people can do a job in so many days, how many days will 20 people do it? A very simple thing, right? You must have done it in primary school. That's the level of problem. That's calculus. It's as simple as that, right? But he did not. Newton's fluxions were very silly. He had something called fluxions which you don't learn. And that is why Marx called them mystical. He said, what is this nonsense mystical thing that Newton is doing? And then Dedekind invented real numbers. So Aryabhat did it using what is called Euler's method, falsely called Euler's method. Euler was familiar with Indian text. He wrote an article on the Indian calendar in 1700. And but that's the way. Everything has to be named after the question. Pardon me? OK. So later, Madhav gave 24 sign values much greater precision. So these are the values. Now these are values proper. These are not sign differences. So as you can see, they are extremely precise values. Same 24 values, but very precise across the entire quadrant. So you can see from the number of zeros that they are very, very precise. This was in the 14th century. Now Europeans needed these trigonometric values for their navigational problem, latitude, longitude, loxodromes. I won't go into all the details. But they needed it. So what did they do? They stole it from Cochin. Jesuits had a college there. They stole it and took it and said, we did it. Clavius published it in his name. But the point is, we are not talking about what they did. We are not talking about history. We are talking about lack of understanding. So what was the lack of understanding? The infinite series was used to derive the uh, sine and cosine and arctangent functions. So this was the kind of shloka you had, nihatya chapa vargena chapam tat tat phalani cha and so on. Now it doesn't make any sense to you. So I will just show you the final result. And this final result probably makes sense to you. You have seen this sign series. Yes? Now this was done there. It is found in the Yukti Deepika and so on. Similarly, you have a cosine series, and you have a series for arc tangent, and so on. But they are infinite series. That is the important thing is they are infinite series. Now if you have an infinite series, how do you sum it? That's the question. How do you sum it? So Indians had some infinite geometric series. You have done finite geometric series. But there was infinite geometric series. It was summed by the 15th century. So it is the sum. You have learned the sum of an infinite geometric series. Finite geometric series, very easy, very old. Goes back to the Rig Veda, goes back to the, uh, you know, uh, you have this um, uh, eye of Horus fraction, very beautiful fraction in Egypt. And that's a finite geometric series. The infinite geometric series is done for the first time in a commentary on Aryabhat. But they did not understand. So I of full fraction, do I have it? Uh, let me see if I have it. Yeah, this is a beautiful fraction. So it's a geometric series. You find this uh, in the uh, various places across Egypt, ancient Egypt. So it is 1 half, 1 fourth, 1 eighth, 1 sixteenth, 1 by 32, 1 by 64. But Europeans did not understand how to sum an infinite series. So, but they claimed on the doctrine of Christian discovery, they said that anything that belongs to the non-Christian is ours. It belongs to the first Christian who sees it. 
<laughs> all right like vasco da gama discovered india where were we before we were discovered yeah madam where were we where were we before we were discovered by vasco da gama i am asking you no no i am asking her the corner she is reading a book and just troubling her a little bit where were we before we were discovered by vasco da gama where were the natives of america before they were discovered by columbus they are right there right why do they say he discovered please think of it so this is something they failed to understand and uh, well there is a infinite series claim by leibniz i won't go into that so newton was a fanatic christian he was invested in slavery he used to his wealth came from slavery a slavery of non christians he had no moral compunctions about it he did not think non christians are human beings so please understand these things which i never talked to you otherwise right just check it out so he had no moral compunctions about stealing from non christians he thought it was this but the west recognized its failure to do infinite sums took them 250 years but they recognized that we don't understand what this is and therefore they dedicated invented real numbers at the end of the 19th century but that was not enough because it needed set theory which was formalized in the 20th century when did newton discover calculus in the 17th century and 20th century you have an understanding of it but uh, they are taught in your school text ninth standard school text just to remind you oh this is limits and derivatives oh, i got it wrong i'm sorry uh but the point is that everything your infinite sums derivatives integrals etc is understood as a limit so here you have square root of 2 as an infinite sum all right and you want to have an exact sum so newton and leibniz could not have understood calculus because we are taught that real numbers are essential they did not have them they came long after them and real numbers do not work if you are interested i can show you a computer program that computers all practical applications such as sending a rocket to the moon is done using computers computers cannot use real numbers they use floating point numbers are you anybody familiar with computers you understand what is a floating point number float float when you say a statement float what does it mean it is floating on what so it is a float is 32 bits and floats do not obey the associative law for addition you send a rocket to the moon based on computer calculations computer calculations use floats they do not use real numbers cannot use real numbers so they have just created a myth it has no practical value that's what i want to say if you want there are details about floating point numbers you can see my notes from 20 years ago so this is what a floating point number is you have a sine bit you have a mantissa you have a base and so on and etc i won't go into that i can show you that it doesn't work but let's leave it so floats are not equal to reals associative law fails for them all right so the math you say it works why should you imitate oh they have sent a rocket to the moon but how did they send a rocket to the moon they did not use real numbers they used floats we use floats how did we send a rocket to the moon isro uses floats they work with computers so that is not the reason to imitate so therefore the correct way is to use this and use something which is called non archimedean arithmetic of polynomials now i think that i won't go into that this was meant for an expert audience to talk about non archimedean arithmetic but basic point is that non archimedean does anybody know something about non archimedean arithmetic ordering <laughs> see this idiot de morgan did not understand minus line less than 0 how could he understand ordering among polynomials he did not understand but the ordering of polynomials is non archimedean that is you have got numbers which can be infinitely large what is the infinitely large number supposing i take x x minus 2 is the polynomial x minus 2 positive or negative it depends on the value of x but as a polynomial was it what is it 
as a polynomial it is declared positive because of sufficiently large values of x it is positive any polynomial can be positive or negative all right so now the question is if you declare it that way then x is greater than 2 x is greater than 3 x is greater than any n because x minus n is always positive for sufficiently large values of x therefore x is greater than n so it's an infinitely large number and it is a field so you get 1 by x which will be an infinitely small number so i won't go into that so uh, well this is how you sum infinite geometric series very easy method you this is simple algebra that 1 minus x if you multiply 1 plus x plus x square then it will give you 1 minus x raised to minus n minus 1 therefore that sum is just 1 minus x raised to n plus 1 by 1 minus x if x is small then for infinite n it becomes infinitesimal and since it is infinitesimal infinitesimal are, do not exist in real numbers they exist in non archimedean arithmetic so you drop it and that is how the sum of infinite geometric series was obtained but the west did not understand so they don't teach you very sorry sad so this course that i have done has been taught in so many places with the postgraduate group it was taught in central university of sarnath tibetan studies it was taught in uh, it was taught to a postgraduate group i won't show you the thing it was taught in iran <laughs> So here is the poster, calculus without limits. Here is the group photo. So this is in Tehran, Delhi. It was here is the group photo there. Social scientists, they are frightened of calculus. It's easy to do. Okay, it was taught in SGT University, Delhi. Oh my, I got it wrong. Got the wrong thing, I'm sorry. I hope the poster is right. Yes, there's a poster, calculus without limits. So, this is the idea and I got the good put the wrong link I'm sorry can't give you the photo I'll show it to you if you want so probability and statistics is the last thing I'm talking about probability and statistics also originated in India right there's an article on probability in ancient India there's an article on probability you can take a look I won't give point is you know about the game of dice Akshasukta. so game of dice is found in the Rig Ved you have the Akshasukta. Okay, so I, uh, should I give you the shloka or you want the translation? Or neither? Both. You want both? Translation. Okay, let's see the translation. So everyone avoids a gambler like an old man avoids horses. Even his mother and father fail to recognize him and so on and so forth. So it's a nice story about what is being told in the, if you're a gambler, he with great enthusiasm, he reaches the gambling place hoping to win. Sometimes he wins and sometimes he uses. The dice do not obey his uh, wishes. They revolt. All right. They pierce his heart <laughs> like of the gambler as easily as an arrow or knife pierces uh, through the skin. They goad him like the ankush and pierce him with hot irons. He, when he wins, he is happy as if a son is born. When he loses, he is as if dead. The 53 <laughs> dice like cards. 52 cards and a joker. They are about time. It's symbolic. They dance and they cannot be controlled by the bravest of the brave. People with hands lose to them. They have no hands and so on. So it's a beautiful shlok in the Aksha Sukta. You can take a look at it. But the point is there was a notion of probability because in the Mahabharat you have an unfair game of dice. And Yudhishthira says there is no uh, uh, Kshatriya Parakram in playing an unfair game. So he knows what is a fair game. All right. There were permutations and combinations. They were there in uh, Indian case and so on and so forth. And so the technique of calculating dice is well known. So uh, <coughs> permutations and combinations, do I have them here? No. I should have them somewhere. I thought, ah, here it is. Uh, so this, this is the slope for permutations and combinations. So you write them one below the other and write them in the opposite order and then divide the top by the four and this is how you will get the theory of permutations and combinations. So this is uh, Sridhar's Pati Ganit. So the point is they knew how to calculate for finite games. 
and the West got it from India, of course, Pascal and so on. But the point I'm making is that they fail to understand it very badly. This idea of limits, which seems to work a little bit with calculus, doesn't work with uh, probability. There's a frequent, I don't know now, this is a bit technical, frequency interpretation. The probability is relative frequency, limit of relative frequency, doesn't work. Studied probability, anybody? Relative frequency? Social scientists need it all the time. You need it for chat GTP, chat GPT. How will you do your uh, uh, programming for artificial intelligence without knowledge of statistics? And you need calculus and you need statistics for that and therefore you need Ganit. So that's what I'm saying now. Let me conclude. I'm sorry if I took a long time. So Swaraj in education is the point. And the starting point for that is Ganit to free the colonized mind from indoctrination because you see at least in one case, in a very important case, that what you have been taught is completely wrong. Needs to be changed. All right? And it is not the case that the West is superior, so you should stop aping it, and they will not allow you to do it easily. You have to fight for it. All right? And formal mathematicians are the most enslaved of the lot. Because formal mathematics, everything depends on the axioms which are decided in the West. So they are subject to Western authority. And they will never come out and debate. I called all of them. Is a single one here? They are all sitting in their department not coming because they are scared. They cannot discuss it in public. They can teach you something in class, but you can't say a word. All right? So, but mathematics is not the monopoly of formal mathematicians. It is your thing if you are using it. It is yours. And it's not just the formal mathematician who can tell you what is right and what is wrong. Thank you very much. Sorry I took such a long time. Now, if there are some pressing questions. Yes, please. No, I'm look I thought you had a question. There's a question on your face. But you've turned your face away now. You have a question? I have a question. Please. It's on, it's on. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, my question. Mm. You will need both this. Take this also. Huh? Uh, my question. But use that mic anyway. My question to you is, uh, like you told us uh, about this Western uh, mathematics and uh, Indian Ganit, but how uh, we as students can learn this Indian Ganit? How can we? Yeah, that's the point that I said, that they force you to learn mathematics. Yeah. So you can only learn if you fight okay. for it. Okay. So that is how, because the textbooks are there, the knowledge is there, hmm. but the will has to be there. The they, will is not there. There are textbooks. There are textbooks. Yeah, I showed you Raju Ganit textbook, for example. Okay. Right? So there are courses, but for them to be taught, it needs a collective will. Because the Neta will not do it, the Babu will not do it. You have to do it because it concerns you. All right, they will say, they will make all sorts of excuses and not do anything. 75 years after independence, they have not done anything. So you have to fight for it. And it can be done. It's not very difficult to do. Thank you, sir. Right? Good afternoon, sir. Yes, please. Sir, basically, my question is, can't we collaborate with NCRT and created such sort of books which, uh, which taught the students about our ancient mathematics and how it just evolved? So can't it be happen? No. It has not happened so far because NCRT is very hostile. They won't let me talk now. For example, I wrote to them, please give me proof, evidence for Euclid, which you mentioned in your class 9 text. What evidence do you have? And they said, see, this Western textbook has got Euclid. I said, I am asking for primary evidence. Oh, see, these two Western textbooks, five Western textbooks, they all mention Euclid, therefore Euclid. <laughs> so NCRT is most uncooperative. Because what is there for them to lose? See, if they make a change, they get into trouble. Everywhere the newspaper, for example, Pythagorean theorem, they tried to remove it in Karnataka. 
how much of a noise was made by the press. Now, what do you know about Pythagoras? I offered a prize of 2 lakh rupees for Pythagoras or for his connection to the theorem named after him. <laughs> Nobody offers, but they make a noise. So, NCRT does not, cannot tolerate that noise. But you have to, because it concerns you. Right? So you have to fight. What I am saying is, you can't, if you say, Are wo kar dega, wo upar se aake sab kuch thik kar dega, nobody is coming. You have to fight, you have to initiate. How did you win freedom? How did India get freedom? Sir, basically we are doing internship there. If we can... We are doing internship <laughs> in NCRT. <laughs> if we can share these thoughts with them. You can share, yeah. but they are not at all happy to do it. Right? I have gone there. I said, let us have a discussion. They are not even willing to have a discussion. They said, yes, 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 we will have, but they won't have. So it is not What's a straightforward thing. Right? So please see that there is a political issue, and you have to find your way around that political issue. Otherwise, there is no problem. Right? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. You have a question? No. You have a question? Yes, please. Mic. Take the mic. Take this mic, otherwise it oh, won't I be recorded. No, it will not be recorded. It will not be recorded. Uh, uh, so thank you. Uh, this is a very illuminating talk and I have listened to it uh, before also and because I'm from a non-mathematics background, from a history background, so I have to make a lot of efforts to technically understand many of the things. but. Uh, uh, but the one question which I feel, uh, which in the present context, since you have raised that we have to fight for it, now our present, uh, you know, dispensation of power is kind of uh, really determined to recover our past. For example, they have deleted the Mughal and all that. Like they said, Ki bhai, we have to have our own correct version of history. Now, uh, what you were talking about also represents a kind of corrected history of mathematics or history of knowledge. So why would, for example, the, uh, uh, those uh, politicians or babus who have talking about corrections of history and there is a, today uh, a large support they are drawing from this country, why is it that they are not, the NCRT is also an institution which is kind of being run by the present dispensation of power, why would they not be interested in recovering the correct history of mathematics in the present times? Because the question is not just about history, first of all. Question is about what you teach. Uh, it's okay. Uh, question is about what you teach. And they do not want that you should escape. See, the dispensation does not, our government does not control the syllabus. Who is there? Let, us, let me ask you a question. Who is the vice chairman of the committee for NEP? Manjul Bhargav who is a formal mathematician from Princeton University, a professor in Princeton University. His entire life has been spent in doing useless number theory, which is of no value to anybody. He's Indian, he is in Princeton, great, so you imitate. That is the policy, that is the actual policy of the government. What noises it makes, I am not talking about. So this government, previous government, any government has always followed that policy that if they make a change in US, for example, after the Sputnik crisis in the 60s, they made a change in math education in the US. Because they were afraid, Russia has sent a rocket. Now what will happen to us? So we must improve education. They spent billions of dollars and they revised the syllabus. Once they revised, what did we say? We know what to do. We know how to ape. So we changed the syllabus without asking anybody. There was no need for it, no neta, no babu is needed. If you are copying the West, anything can be done. But you are going against the West, nothing can be done. All right, so it is a lot of shosha, and it is not uh, something which, why has it not happened in so many years? And why have we got Manjul Bhargav there? I asked the deputy education, the, the minister for the Satpal Singh, I said, let's have a discussion. They gave me an award. So I asked him, let's have a discussion. Don't have to do anything. Call Manjul Bhargav. We will have a public discussion. Like I said, we will have a public discussion with mathematicians here. What did he say? Are mere hat mein kuch nahi hai. Mere hat mein hota ta ek minute mein kar deta. <laughs> right? So this is the state of affairs with the neta. And similar thing with babus. They cannot do anything because they don't know anything. They are afraid. So it is not a straightforward thing. 
and I am saying that the people who are suffering, they have to raise a voice. Otherwise, nothing will happen if you think that people are sitting to do good to you. No, they are sitting for their profit. And if you don't take care of your interests, you will lose out. Yes, please. Hello, sir. I'm Omanj. I uh, did like uh, I pursued science till twelfth only. Now I'm not in the scientific field anymore. But firstly, I'm actually very, very impressed by the whole uh, talk you gave to us. I mean, it was very, very inspiring, and I'm actually very influenced by whatever you taught. Uh, my first question would be um, where you taught about the axiomatic mathematics, where uh, the reason minus facts. So whenever we apply maths and science, for example, chemistry, we uh, let's say um, we talk about real and uh, ideal gases. So in in those concepts, we generally say this is not practically possible. It's just like it's just there. I mean, whenever we talk about let's ideal gases, they're not. I mean, the whole concept it's not practically possible, but we still study. So what is the logic behind hmm. studying? That, that is a different thing. There you are setting up a simplified model. An ideal gas is a simplified model for a real fluid. Real fluid has viscosity, it has thermal conductivity, it has all sorts of things. So you are just setting it up as a simplified model in order to get some general idea of what is happening, a rough theory. All right, so that is no problem. You're simplifying. But here, you are saying real numbers is a must. But real numbers can never be used. They can never be seen. They can never be uh, written down. Square root of two exact real numbers. So there is a problem. And now this is being said, why? Because the axioms have laid down by the West. They allow the West to control knowledge, mathematical knowledge. Just as the church controlled theology by saying that you don't allow facts. We will decide. Angel can be seen or not seen. How many angels are going to fit on a pin? Aquinas will say, authority will say, and then everybody else follows. So there is a big difference between the ideal gases and this. But there you just have a simplified theory. Everybody understands it's a simplified theory. OK, so no problem with a the simplified theory. But here it's an authoritative claim, which no one understands. That's a problem. OK? Thank you. Perhaps I should finish. Oh, we, we just finish off with some questions if there are. Uh, how, what time is it? I'm sorry. You want to? Oh. -ho. What's wrong with my phone? Yeah, what time is it? 